On the last Crit Bits, we talked about shock. And there's four types of shock. There's hypovolemic shock, there's obstructive shock, there's cardiogenic shock, and there's distributive shock. And we also talked about the three main components that make up perfusion. The intravascular status, or the tank, cardiac output, or the pump, and the systemic vascular resistance, also known as the pipes. Today we're going to talk about hypovolemic shock. This is a drop in the intravascular volume which decreases the preload to the heart, so the tank is essentially empty. The heart compensates by increasing the heart rate and the stroke volume to increase cardiac output up until a point where it becomes decompensated and there's not enough blood to fill the heart. And finally, the peripheral vascular resistance squeezes down to make sure that as the pressure is dropping in the system, it maintains the perfusion pressure to the end organs. And we're gonna mention this over and over again. When you're assessing a patient in shock, always assess the tank, the pump, and the pipes because the cause of the shock might not be immediately clear, but as you go through this algorithm, you're gonna figure this out. You like that? The pump, the pipe, the tanks? Well, if you like that, why don't you go ahead and like this video and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Anyway, let's get on to the rest of this. So when talking about hypovolemic shock, there are two main types. We have hemorrhagic and non-hemorrhagic. Hemorrhagic is just what you would expect. It's the acute loss of blood. And there's a variety of causes for this. It could be due to trauma, whether that's penetrating or blunt. It could be due to a GI bleed. It could be due to massive hemoptysis, although this is not usually what kills your patient. Asphyxia is what kills these patients. This can also be from a coagulopathy. Maybe the patient is on antiplatelets or an anticoagulant, and this causes some internal or external bleeding. That's why it's so important to get a good medication history from your patients. Because if you have this, then we can try and reverse this process. We can also have non-hemorrhagic causes from vomiting, diarrhea, fistulas that will not stop putting out fluid, from small bowel obstructions, excessive diuretic use, environmental exposure with excess sweating, and don't forget about the patient who doesn't have access to water. This might be a patient who's hospitalized with dementia or might be a person who's in a nursing home and their caregivers aren't giving them fluids. This is a situation where the person might become dehydrated because they didn't have access to water. Now, unless someone has a knife sticking out of them, hemorrhagic shock is not always so obvious. So think about places where a person can lose a significant amount of blood causing hemorrhagic shock. The cavities in the body are the thoracic cavity, the abdominal cavity, the pelvic cavity, the retroperitoneum, and the thigh. These are all places where a person can lose a significant amount of blood and go into hemorrhagic shock and die. Sometimes your trauma surgeon will try and trick you and say, don't forget about the sixth compartment where someone can lose blood, and that's the street. I never really got how this was a compartment, and that's probably why I didn't get a good grade on my trauma rotation. As you're concurrently resuscitating your patients, you're gonna have to ask the question of why this person is bleeding or why this person is losing volume. And then of course, you're going to have to go ahead and fix that problem. If it's a patient who's having trauma and a visible bleed, you're gonna apply compression. If it's a person that has an internal bleed, they'll have to go to the operating room. If it's somebody who has a coagulopathy, you're going to have to reverse that process by giving them some FFP or platelets. If it's a person who has a GI bleed, then they're gonna have to have endoscopy and have that lesion repaired. Always try to figure out the why and fixing it as you're resuscitating your patients. As you're resuscitating your patient, you have to know if it's a hemorrhagic cause or a non-hemorrhagic cause because the fluid you give that person does matter. For example, if someone is having a hemorrhagic cause of shock, you want to avoid giving those patients crystalloid. You want to avoid crystalloids because of the lethal triad. This lethal triad is dilution, acidosis, and hypothermia. When you give your patients crystalloid, we are diluting the platelets, the coagulation factors, so that blood does not clot as well. That person will not close off that opening that led to the bleed. The person becomes acidosis, especially if you use things like normal saline, which is acidotic to the normal serum. This acidosis leads to coagulation factors and enzymes not working as well as they normally do in a normal pH state. Finally, even when you give these patients room temperature crystalloids, it's still relatively cool with respect to the person's body. And what happens is that person becomes 
cold on the inside. And again, these coagulation factors and enzymes don't work very well. So avoid this lethal triad when you have someone in hemorrhagic shock. And instead, what you should do is you should give this person what they're losing, and that is blood. And there's lots of data now that tells us that when you replace blood, it shouldn't just be RBCs. It should be a balanced transfusion of red blood cells, platelets, and FFP or plasma. When you provide patients with these components, you're basically giving them back the blood they, they lost and there's less dilution. Try to warm up that blood when you give it to them and also don't forget about calcium. When you have somebody who's in a non-hemorrhagic shock situation, you can give them crystalloids back, but just be careful because if you over-resuscitate these patients, they can still get dilution, they can still get acidosis, and they can still get hypothermia. You wanna give the person just what they need to resuscitate them. This, however, is one of the questions in critical care that we have not perfected yet. There's lots of ways that we can get closer to the answer of how that person's volume status is, but that's gonna be coming up later on this season in Crit Bits. When you have someone who is having hypovolemic shock, ask the question if it's hemorrhagic or non-hemorrhagic, ask the question of why that's happening, try to fix that problem, and then give them the appropriate fluid that they need as you're fixing that person's problem. Oh yeah, and one more thing. Subscribe to the channel. See you next time.